Hello, and welcome to the Emma's for Mama podcast. I'm your host, Abby Halberstadt, happy wife, mama to 10, Bible-believing Christian. And on today's show, we're going to start a series that I don't actually know how long it's going to last, but we're going to have at least one or two episodes, I think, on the grand family adventure that we took to Europe. I've been having a lot of requests for me to talk about the logistics of how we planned for that, the countries that we visited, the highlights, what we loved most, you know, how we planned for meals, um, just kind of all the things. And so today I'm just going to start with a general overview. I think that I will end up combining some of those topics because I can't imagine talking about logistics for 30 minutes. That might work better in a blog post and I may write a blog post, which would have a lot of links for you guys. But today I just want to start out with kind of the backstory for how this trip came to be and then to give you a little bit of an overview of what the trip was like, maybe I'll give you our high-low buffalo and I'll explain what that is when we get there. So just a jumping off point, I started talking about this in a couple of episodes, I think when I was talking about my birth story series, because I was explaining why there was going to be a gap in service for this podcast and talking about the fact that the reason was I had tried to record as many podcasts as I could leading up to this big trip. And I didn't get all of them filled in because we were gone for six whole weeks. So you probably know the backstory to some extent, but the backstory is this about four years ago, maybe closer to five, four and a half, Sean and I started talking about the concept of taking our family on a big trip. And he and I have both been to Europe together twice in two separate scenarios. One was when I went to Europe with my mom for 21 days on a Rick Steves tour called Europe Through the Back Door. If you've ever heard of Rick Steves, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've heard of this guy. I know what this is. And it's supposed to be kind of an off the beaten path, little known location, stay in cool, quaint bed and breakfast type trip. And it was, it was amazing. My mom and I had a blast. And then my husband, who was at the time my boyfriend, came and met us there as well as my brother. And then we went from, I believe it was Paris to Spain, where we spent two weeks helping out at a youth camp. So that was our first experience in Europe, which was not your typical European experience because most of our time was obviously taken up with the youth camp, which is why we were there. But we also got to do some sightseeing. We really enjoyed it. Spain was beautiful. But I'd gotten to see seven countries in addition to what he got to see. So we always wanted to go back and we were planning on doing that for our 10th anniversary. But if you've had a lot of babies, you know that anytime you're planning on travel, you have to kind of have your hand wide open because if you're too pregnant or too sick or have just had a baby or are just about to, you know, just there's a lot of logistics that you can't really plan for if you're not specifically planning your pregnancy around the trip. So we did, in fact, get pregnant with number six at a time that would have made it really kind of inconvenient for us to go to Europe and so for our 10th anniversary. So instead, we switched it to our ninth, and I was 13 weeks pregnant with Theo. And we had two-year-old twins, Evianola, and then three older kids, you know, not much older, but something like um, eight, six, and three and a half or four, somewhere around there. My very nice parents kept the older three, and my very nice in-laws kept Evie and Nola. And we went for about 10 days, and it was the best trip of our lives. I would say up until this trip with our family, by far. We've actually gotten to travel a fair bit. We've been to Hawaii two or three times. Usually those are in combination with work trips. So Sean travels quite a bit for his work for installing software systems for 911 dispatch services. And so... He has been able to go to some cool places and I get to tag along sometimes. So I, we've gotten to go to Australia, although that was not a work trip. He had been to Australia before on a work trip and knew that he wanted to take me one day. That was a while back. We've been to Kauai. We've been to Honolulu twice. We've gotten to travel around the U.S. either on his work trips or just as the opportunity arose. But we had not been able to go to Europe other than that time when we were not yet married and certainly didn't have kids. So we we planned out this whole trip. We decided to go to three different places. Uh, Santorini, Greece, which was phenomenal. 
uh, London for, I think it was about a day and a half in Paris and all three just exceeded our expectations. So I think fast forwarding to a couple of years ago from that time, nine years ago when we had gone. So a couple of years ago, I say four. So it had been five or six years since we'd gotten to go on this Europe trip. And we really wanted to share that with our kids. And we were starting to get kids that were old enough to remember it and appreciate it. And we were in between pregnancies. And so we thought, we're going to plan this tentatively, but you can only plan tentatively so much because you have to book your plane tickets and you have to book your Eurostar tickets and you have to, a lot of times, book things like tickets to the Eiffel Tower months in advance if there's any chance that you're going to get good places in line. There's just a lot that you have to plan for. And so it's this hard tension between this concept that James talks about of if the Lord wills, we will go and do and you know, travel or have children or eat this next meal, whatever it is. But also knowing that if you wait right to the last second, sure, the Lord might provide, but honestly, you probably won't have a plane ticket. So we were just prayerfully approaching it and also trying to be good stewards of the details that we needed to line up with booking Airbnbs and trying to find a car big enough for our family. Because we had eight kids at the time. Shiloh, when we first started planning, was only about six months old, and he was going to be somewhere in the 14-month-old range when we actually travel. Well, if you remember this story from the Twin Bees birth story, I got pregnant with them in January of 2020. We discovered we were having twins. About 11 weeks later, I was a little freaked out at the concept that we were going to be going to Europe with my being pregnant with twins. And then we found out we couldn't go anyway because of COVID. So we laid a lot of groundwork for an itinerary that felt like we could do it with a bunch of kids. We had booked plane tickets, which thankfully Air France refunded. We had booked a ton of Airbnbs. And thankfully they got refunded too for the most part. There were a couple that didn't refund certain fees, but pretty much all of them refunded things because people had to have COVID policies because so many people around the world found their travel disrupted when they were trying to go somewhere in the spring and everything shut down. And so we had done some groundwork, but we kind of just decided to scrap it. And we didn't know that we would ever pursue this again, especially with baby twins. And about a year ago, it's August now, so more than a year ago, probably 14 months ago, we started revisiting this concept because Titus and Toby were sleeping better. You know, they were more self-sufficient. They're certainly not self-sufficient or anywhere close, but they had a little more, you know, ability to eat more things than just nursing from mama. We had actually done a trip to Alaska right about the time we were thinking about revisiting the Europe idea. And I wouldn't say Alaska was kind of the litmus test, but it was a good dry run because it was a really long travel day. It was about 16 hours of travel with two little twins that weren't even two years old, plus eight other children. And the kids rocked it. They did incredibly well. So I think that that gave us some courage to think that this was doable. But we just kept thinking about the logistics of the fact that there were things that we weren't really going to be able to take all of us to do. So as we prayed about it, the niggling thought or kind of the, the deal breaker, whatever the right term is, I'm trying to think of how, how to word this, that kept popping into our brains was if we had the right person to take with us who could help out with the younger kids, but most importantly, be with the younger kids, someone safe and close to us that could be with the younger kids when we went on adventures with the older kids where it would make it exponentially harder to have two toddlers and a four-year-old with us, or maybe even two toddlers, a four-year-old and a six-year-old in some cases, if it was a long hike or something more arduous or, or scary, you know, and by scary, I don't mean dangerous. I just mean, for example, at some point we went paragliding and the six-year-old wasn't even allowed to go. So to have someone that was trustworthy that we could take with us. And we just started kind of praying about who that could possibly be. And we tested out a couple of options and neither one of them had schedule availability, which is huge because you want someone that is a full fledged adult who has the ability to handle the responsibility, who has some experience with children, who has flexibility of schedule. And my goodness, that is hard to come by. And yet 
the Lord was so gracious to provide us with the absolute perfect person. She is actually one of my virtual assistants, and she is the daughter of one of my dearest friends. You've heard me talk about Jennifer Flanders, who I'm going to have on the podcast soon, and you will love that episode. She is so full of wisdom and joy in motherhood and in life, and she is quite honestly the closest. I always get a little bit uncomfortable when people use terms like super mom about anyone, especially me, but about anyone. And yet superwoman, she is the closest person that I know with her many, many talents. So you guys are going to really enjoy having her on because she's also incredibly humble and generous spirited, which is not always a combo that you see with also pretty much being superwoman. So that's a little tangent, but that's also something to look forward to because she has promised me she will come on the podcast and I'm looking forward to it. So her daughter, Rachel, who works for me, ended up having schedule flexibility, had experience working with twins and other nannying jobs. I mean, she just was perfection for this role that we were hoping there would possibly be someone that could fill it. And and she did. And she did a fantastic job. And we really enjoyed bringing her along with us. But that was kind of the Gideon's fleece. Like if we can find somebody, if the Lord brings along the right person. And I remember when Jennifer told me that Rachel was the most excited about spending time with our children. Europe was awesome, but she was the most excited about spending time with the kids because she loved kids. And I was like, that's the kind of person that you want to be on a trip with you. So that kind of clinched it for us. But I have to tell you that leading up to this trip, I expected something to go wrong at every turn. When you have planned as much as you could possibly plan, And then you find out that you're pregnant with twins. And then you find out that your trip is canceled because of a worldwide pandemic. You are definitely approaching take number two with fear and trembling. You are feeling like this could go sideways in a heartbeat and I have to be okay with that. And really, honestly, the Lord gave us so much peace with that first round getting canceled that while we were incredibly disappointed, of course, we weren't devastated. We weren't feeling robbed of a good life experience. And we were able to see the Lord's hand in the timing and the orchestration of everything because ultimately with that pregnancy being as hard as it ended up being, it would not have been a wise thing for me to be on an airplane for six, eight hours, nine hours at a time, just with circulation and, you know, high risk pregnancy, all that stuff. So the Lord, I think really protected us. So going forward, there were a couple of factors that could have gone sideways. And some of them in a very good way. We could have gotten pregnant, which would have derailed the trip in, if, if it meant that the pregnancy was too close to fruition, that we couldn't go. We could have not been able to find anybody and felt like it was unwise to go or at least would limit our options to go if we didn't find someone that could help out with the younger kids and stay with them if we went on adventures with the older kids. And then travel costs had gone up considerably, as well as travel restrictions and the ability to get passports. And so all of this, we just approached with one step at a time. Like, let's see if the next door opens. Let's see if the next door opens. And the Lord just kept opening door after door. And I just kept kind of holding my breath, but being like, Lord, I think you're actually going to do this. So we ended up getting our tickets to Europe for the same price that we paid for them three years before, which is nuts because gas prices have shot through the roof. Just everything, you know, with all of the inflation that we see, including in travel, but sometimes especially in travel, it was an absolute miracle that we ended up scoring all of our tickets for $500 a piece with the average. I think the adult tickets were a little bit more than 500 and the kid tickets were a little bit less. So it averaged out around there. And if you think about it, and if you've priced any tickets anywhere, if you're in the U.S. and you've priced tickets in the U.S. any time recently, you know that if you're in Texas and you fly to Missouri, it costs $700. And I can drive to Missouri in seven hours. So, you know, the fact that we could fly all the way across the Atlantic and back for $500 for each person was phenomenal. Mind blown. In fact, Sean put the tickets on hold and then he went ahead and bought them. And we were still kind of in a Lord willing, this works out type of situation. And then he went back to check on them a couple days later to see what the price had changed to. And they had tripled in price. And we were like, wow. And those, those cheap tickets, such as they were, didn't exist anywhere. It was the only place he'd been able to find them. And yeah, it worked out. So that was another door that the Lord opened that we were so grateful for. So 
It was pretty smooth sailing planning. Now, Sean might not think so because he does the preponderance of the logistical planning and details. I pack everybody. I order everything. I get us all set to go. I definitely look for Airbnbs and give input on things, but he's the one that did the vast majority of the research for, you know, how the metro system works, what we need tickets to, what we needed to get ahead of time, what we could get in line for on the day of, researching activities in particular locations, tracking down, you know, reviews and articles about the best places to go and the best places to stay and he did such an amazing job. And I think when I do another podcast about the logistics that I will either have him on here to talk and he is already, as he's listening to this, cringing because he is not a fan of being in front of the camera, but maybe I'll be able to talk him into that. At the very least, I'll get him to write me up a list of everything that he went through because people are pretty flabbergasted that we managed to take a 45 day trip to Europe without a travel agent. And yet my husband, I think probably could run the socks off of quite a few travel agents and that's no insult to travel agents. That's just how thorough he is. And so he did all of that planning for us. And between the two of us and our different jobs, we were ready to go. And then we found out with about six weeks to go that Toby's passport. So Toby is our number 10 two and a half at the time that his passport wasn't coming. Well, Titus has had taken it sweet time. We had gone at the beginning of February. So we'd had an ice storm here in East Texas and we tried to go, I think in January and the passport office was closed down. Big limb had fallen on their roof. Our appointment was canceled. So that was kind of hiccup number one. And then we went back and redid the passport uh, appointment in early February, probably the first week of February. We paid expedite fees just in case. They took the passport photo. She looked at them and said, oh yeah, these are great. And really the babies, I call them the babies, the twin bees, Titus and Toby sat really still and did really well for the whole passport photo process. So I didn't doubt her. I mean, they, they looked straight into the camera, had serious faces. I think one of them smiled. So or maybe both of them did, but they, they have more leniency for kids smiling than they do for adults. So I wasn't too worried about it. And this lady does this for her job and she said they'd be great, right? So around, we were supposed to leave on May 1st and around the end of March, middle to end of March, we started to get a little antsy because these passports were supposed to come in five to six weeks, like a month to six weeks, six weeks being the outer uh, mark. And they haven't shown up yet. And we have six weeks to go and we're okay, but we're kind of like, oh, it, would, it would be, it would be nice to have these passports in our hands. And so just as Sean is calling the passport office to check on them, a couple days later, Titus just shows up and we're like, okay, there you go. Toby's is coming next. And several more days went by, a week goes by, Sean calls again, Toby's is not materializing we're thinking, oh no, you know, like what, what are we going to do now? Because we can't start over the whole process. Obviously, if it took however long it took, seven or nine weeks ultimately to get Titus's and we're within the month mark and we don't have Toby's, how are we going to get this passport in time? And then he finally gets an answer, which is that Toby's passport photo has been rejected. And if you guys follow me on social media at MS for Mama on Instagram or Facebook, then you guys probably follow it along with the saga of our realizing that we now have about timeline is starting to blur in my head, but just a couple of weeks and we don't have a passport for Toby and they're not interested in our getting a passport. Like it does not mean anything to them that we don't have a passport for our two year old, that there are 13 people going on this trip and one of them does not have a passport, which obviously could derail the entire trip. So I'm thinking, Oh Lord, please not again. And we start calling passport offices each morning and we find out, oh, we could go to El Paso. Well, El Paso is about 13 hours from us. We're in Texas and El Paso is in Texas, but Texas is so huge that El Paso is still 13 hours drive and a pretty considerable, you know, go to the airport, get on a plane, get down there, go to the passport office, potentially have to wait till the next day. I mean, it was, it was going to be an ordeal. And we are also looking at graduating our oldest son. I was I had several speaking events in that those last couple of weeks, several deadlines I was meeting for book launching and just holy moly, it was so many things at once. And we were trying to figure out how in the world we were going to get this passport in time. 
So thankfully, my dear readers told me that one thing we could do is we could reach out to our local state representative because they're supposed to advocate for you. One of their, one of their jobs is to help you get in touch with government agencies like the passport agency if they aren't just answering the every man's call. And so we ended up getting a passport appointment for the day that we left. And y'all, I was sweating bullets and praying like crazy and just feeling like, how in the world? Because Sean was like, okay, Toby and I can get up at like four in the morning. We can drive to Dallas. We can be completely ready to go by the moment the passport office opens. And then you can bring everybody else. And I'm thinking everybody else and all of our stuff for 45 days in Europe. And, you know, no pressure kind of thing. Not that we wouldn't have packed the car ahead of time. We did. But that just felt like a disaster waiting to happen. And also we had been reading things about how you might have a same day appointment and supposedly get your passport back the same day. But they also might tell you that, sorry, we're not going to process it today. And if they didn't process it that day, then we were going to have to either scrap the trip or split up. So it was starting to get stressful. So basically what we did, and this is something that you can take into account and keep in mind for the future, because I've had a whole lot of readers message me after hearing what happened to us and be like, what did you do to get this passport? Because we're trying to go to Cancun or we're trying to go to Canada or we're trying to go to, I haven't heard of Europe yet, but trying to go somewhere. And we, you know, same thing happened to us. They rejected our photo or it got stuck in transit or they lost it in the mail. And so basically what we learned was that since January, 2023, there's been over at this point, probably well over half a million passport applications, which is well over their normal number of applicants. And so they're just snowed under and understandably they don't really care about the individual plight of a two-year-old because they've they're just buried under a mountain of requests. So what Sean did was he called the moment that the passport office opened about three days in a row. And apparently there's a certain number of passport appointments that they hand out each day. And if you're there at the very, very beginning of the day, you might get one of those appointments. So I don't remember what the number was that we ended up getting, but we ended up getting like probably three or four different passport appointments. You know, one was in Denver and the first one was supposed to be in El Paso and we got one and the one that was supposed to be on the day that we left was in Dallas, which is where we were flying out of. One was supposed to be in like Hot Springs, Arkansas. And literally as we were on the phone trying to get it finalized, it disappeared. So it's kind of like putting a hot ticket item in your cart and then having someone buy it out from under you if another agent passes that appointment off to someone else. And so we're like, no, because he goes, oh, nope, it's not available anymore. I just refreshed my screen. So here's the thing, though. The Lord made it so evident that he was taking care of us this whole time because two things happened, one of them that seemed very bad and one that was just amazing. And yet it all ended up working out. So one was that our helper, Rachel, had assumed that her passport was current because she had traveled somewhat recently with her family and all of their passports were current. But when she went to pack and looked at her passport, she realized it had actually been acquired at a different time than the rest of her family. Nobody remembered that. And it was expired. And this was on the Tuesday before we left and we were leaving the following Monday. So now we had at this point still no passport for Toby, no passport for Rachel. Now <laughs> we were like, what is going on? Oh, what, what are we going to do? So thankfully, Rachel's family, Rachel, did the same thing we were doing, just kept calling. And we both ended up with Dallas appointments the week before. And so I think on a Wednesday or a Thursday, Sean drove Toby up there, got there first thing in the morning, got his picture taken. And what was funny was that we had the original picture that had been rejected, which was the whole cause of this drama. And... He showed it to the lady and said, when she had taken Toby's retake picture, said, what is wrong with this picture? And she goes, absolutely nothing. That is a fantastic child photo for a passport that should not have been rejected. I have no idea what they were thinking. And what's funny is the second one, he looked like something out of the, you know, dust bowls of the 1930s. He looked like some sort orphan child dressed in sackcloth he looked mournful and he didn't even look like himself which I know you're not supposed to smile but in any case it was just funny because it was like this was this was a bunch of drama for nothing however Sean went up there did that and lo and behold even though it was supposed to be a same day appointment they told him they would not have it processed for 24 hours well one of the things that I had 
packed into this last week right before we left was one last speaking engagement in Dallas on Friday, on April 28th. I remember because we left on May 1st. It was like three days before we left. And so we drove up there on the Friday of my speaking engagement and Sean was coming with me to help work the merch table for paint and pros. And if you don't know what that is, I'll put a link down in the show notes. And then he ran and got Toby's passport. And the day that they had gone super early at like 7.30 in the morning, the moment that they opened, he said it wasn't busy at all. But when he went to pick up the passport in the afternoon, it was packed and he had to wait for a long time. So just the timing worked out. Rachel ended up also getting an appointment that she could do basically kind of the same thing a couple days before. And then her mom, Jennifer, was coming to the same conference that I was speaking at. It was a homeschooling conference and we both homeschool. And she went and did the same thing, ran and got Rachel's passport picked up. And so we were all set to go with, you know, two, two and a half whole days to spare, which is way better than what it would have happened if we tried to get it on the day of, because I genuinely don't believe that we would have gotten it in time. Now, I have heard that they will prioritize when you have to leave. So possibly they would have done a huge rush project on Toby's passport if they knew that we were leaving that afternoon, but it still would have been an extra layer of stress, which it already felt like a couple of layers of stress at this point. But we got him with a couple of days to spare. All impediments were out of the way and we were set and ready to go. And I will tell you this, the thought of being in Europe for 45 days, which little side note, our original trip was going to be about 32 days. And as we were revisiting the itinerary, Sean said, I really feel like we need some breathing time. What do you think about adding some more time? And I said, let's do it. I mean, it's right at the end of the school year. We don't have any obligations. I'm a fitness instructor, so I had to get subs for six weeks. But other than that, both his and my work can be done from computers, can be done remotely, can be done at odd hours. And so we really were in a pretty sweet spot for not being as, eh, for at the, being at the end of an extremely busy season, extremely, extremely busy season. I don't think I, and, and by extension, the whole family, Sean as well, have ever been as busy as we were in the spring of 2023. But there's something about kind of taking off those next things like, okay, I got that out of the way. I got that out of the way. I got that out of the way with the goal of being able to get on an airplane with all your kids and go to Europe that, you know, you're like, I don't even care. I don't even care how packed this is. I don't care how nuts the schedule is or the fact that I'm hosting a graduation party like 10 days before I have to get on an airplane and packing for all these people. Like, it's fine. You just you just do the next thing, right? Well, the prospect of being in Europe for 45 days, which we made 45 days because we wanted more breathing room to have some downtime, to have some more relaxation days, to visit another country didn't really daunt me at all. I felt like we traveled enough with our kids and that they were good travelers and that we were good at working together at this point, you know, not great, not perfect, but that we were good at watching out for each other, that we had found a good person to bring with us that would be helpful. But it was that plane ride that really kind of, I couldn't look out too closely because Titus and Toby are just not sit still and watch a movie type of kids. They are not eat a snack for 20 straight minutes and chat. They are get up, climb over the back of the seat, bonk each other on the head with toys, vocalize about everything. Like they're sweet and we love them to death, but there is no sit still mode for those children. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but they don't tend toward that. And I can remember our whole family went to a family wedding in California when Shiloh, who is a firecracker personality, y'all, now he is opinionated about everything. He has so much energy. He's not a sit still child either. But I can remember we went to California when he was probably 10 months old. And I can remember his sitting beside me and just chilling beside me, reading books, eating snacks, snuggling, watching a movie. He was such a dream baby on that flight. <laughs> I can remember Titus and Toby at 10 months and that would have never happened. So maybe some of my dread of that plane flight or just the whole really long travel day was because of past experience with Titus and Toby and just knowing how active they are and kind of some plane flights that, that hadn't gone as well, not gone terribly, but had been a little stressful the whole time. I say they did amazing to Alaska and they really did, but it was, 
it was never, oh, look, they sat down and they're chill. I'm going to relax. It was kind of this constant song and dance unless they had fallen asleep. So I had just been kind of not looking too closely at the prospect of that plane ride of the fact that we were going to immediately jump on a train after we got off the plane. Pretty much we had a couple of hours in between, but we, we didn't even have a day before we got on a two hour train ride. And then we weren't really going to get to our final destination until Tuesday evening when we had started out traveling on Monday morning. Now there is a time difference there of about six hours, but still that is kind of an incredible wallop of a trip with 10 children, all the luggage, all the different personalities, all the potential for travel things not to go well. And y'all, the Lord, won't he do it? (laughs) He worked every detail out. Um, We had some touch and go moments. Titus, we had some melatonin gummies and I gave the melatonin gummies and Titus responded by losing his mind. I mean, we're talking arching, screaming, obviously just miserably tired, but would not give in for about 20 minutes. Thankfully, the flight attendants were really nice. Thankfully, we were all kind of taking up a whole row so that people in front of us could put in noise canceling, you know, earbuds. And the people behind us were also in our row because there were so many of us. And so we kind of had this insulated thing going on. And he finally gave up after about 20 minutes, which in the grand scheme of things is not very long to have a kid scream at you went to sleep and slept the rest of the flight. That big long flight to London was the one that I was like, we may be like marching up and down the aisles. We may be baby wearing and squatting and swaying and and just going through every possible option for entertainment and distraction. But they slept, both Titus and Toby slept the entire flight once they they conked out. So that was a huge answer to prayer. And then also we had this kind of scary moment when we had flown already from Dallas to Atlanta And we were trying to get on the flight to London and the lady checking us in, I'm not even sure exactly what happened, but somehow all of her records were messed up and some of us weren't listed in the ticket sales. And then when she put us all back in, we were going to be in completely different seats, all separated from each other, which, you know, it's not great for a two-year-old to be off by himself and a four-year-old to be off by himself. And so we were scrambling, trying to trade places with people and that ended up working out really well. So... The Lord took care of us, and I see more so even how much he took care of us in the fact that I had a friend that traveled right after we got back to Europe and ended up having plane flights canceled, and I'm not saying the Lord didn't take care of her, but she was traveling with teenagers and adults as opposed to toddlers, and teenagers and adults tend to do a little bit better with layovers and missed flights and unfortunate travel situations than toddlers do. So it felt like a huge mercy from the Lord that he pretty much helped us to just get straight there without too many hiccups. Um, so we started out in London and we had thought we would stay in London for a week. But what we found out from a reader friend whom I had told earlier than I told anybody else because we've gotten to be friends and message quite a bit back and forth that we were coming to the UK and we were hoping to meet. We didn't end up being able to, sadly, because her kids and she got a stomach bug right before we were going to take a train out to the English countryside and meet their family, which such a bummer. But her name is Caroline and she told me that we probably didn't want to come the week that we had planned to come to England because it was the week of coronation, which made us giggle because when we booked our tickets, you know, I talked about this idea of this weird tension between saying, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that, but also we've got to plan it ahead enough that we get, you know, good deals and actually get a spot. We had planned our plane tickets to London before Queen Elizabeth died. So there was no coronation when we planned these tickets. But I wouldn't have known about the coronation until probably it was too late to change anything except for this friend telling me. So instead of changing where we were flying to, because we couldn't, we changed where we were staying for that week to Paris, which would have been at the end of our trip. And instead we landed in Heathrow and then we had a couple of hours. Then we jumped on the Eurostar and we took the Eurostar to Paris. And then we took an extremely crowded and hot and cramped, crazy metro ride at our, I don't even know what hour, 30 or something like that, 34, 
to um, the neighborhood where we were staying and then trekked our way to our apartment. We were staying in the fifth arrondissement in Paris in the Latin Quarter in an Airbnb that had four floors and we were at the top. So I know that it gets much higher than that. I had readers that were like, hey, that's nothing. I stayed in an Airbnb or I lived in an apartment for a while that was on the eighth floor or the seventh floor. You wouldn't believe how amazing my calf muscles were. And I was thinking, I bet I would because carrying twin toddlers up four flights of stairs over and over again was plenty. So we started out in Paris and we were there for about a week. And then we went to the French countryside and we were there for about a week. And then we went to this really beautiful little strip of Mediterranean coastline called the Cinque Terre, which means the five towns. And there are five towns lined up. We actually didn't stay in any of the five towns. We stayed in Levanto, which is north, I believe, of all five towns, but not far away at all in this quaint, beautiful Airbnb kind of up on a bluff and you could see down to the coastline to the Cinque Terre and we stayed there for about five or six days and then we went to, I have to think about the order of everything because I always get this backwards geographically, I believe we went to Rome and then we went through Tuscany and then we went to Venice and from Venice, we went to Bavaria in Germany. And basically, we drove through Austria, just a little sliver of Austria, into Germany. And the Bavarian district is just lush and green. And it's basically nestled inside the German Alps, Austrian Alps, depending on which side of the border you are. In fact, one night, we had a lot of things to celebrate while we were there. We did Mother's Day while we were there. We did... Ezra's 17th birthday while we were there and then Sean and I had our 18th wedding anniversary while we were there and that happened while we were in Bavaria in on the German side but we drove over into Austria to this fun little restaurant and walked around looking at the gorgeous gorgeous countryside. Bavaria was just breathtakingly beautiful and it was only like a maybe a 30 minute drive to that restaurant so that sh shows you how close we were to the border. It was basically Austria and Germany at the same time. And each place that we went was, I would say, successively more beautiful. Not because the place before it hadn't been, but just because the wow factor kept getting upped. And each time we got closer to the Alps, I think that was a, that was a huge thing for our family. We just really enjoyed the mountains. We enjoyed the majesty of them. We enjoyed hiking in them. And so the last big place that we went before London, because remember we landed in London, but we didn't stay, was Switzerland. And we stayed... I think about an hour from Interlaken and our Airbnb was across from this beautiful Swiss lake, which was right up against, you know, green hills that were dotted by quaint little houses. And at night, all their lights would come on and it was just magical. Honestly, it was magical. And the beauty there was just next level. The atmosphere literally is clearer. And brighter and everything just looks like you're you're viewing it in technicolor so at one point we did a hike in Muren I believe is where we were Switzerland and we're hiking through basically the Alps but through fields of wildflowers and there are cows with cowbells on fuzzy cows just wandering the fields and you know you could walk up to them and they would nuzzle your hand and lick the salt off your arm from the sweat from the hike the sun is blazing overhead. The Alps are soaring above you. Everything is purples and greens and blues and yellows and crisp. And there's white on the peaks of the Alps. And the girls kept saying, it's like being in a scene from Heidi. It's so beautiful. Or from Sound of Music. We definitely did a video with The Hills Are Alive with The Sound of Music playing as the soundtrack in the background. And I think that I'm going to wrap up mostly here now, having told you the itinerary. And of course, I left off London. Remember, we started there, but we didn't stay there. And it was so interesting to see just how the Lord orchestrated. Yes, we put a lot of thought into that itinerary. Yes, we planned meticulously as best we could. But I don't think we had any idea having never been as a family. I had been to most of the places on that 21-day trip with my mom. I had been to Austria. I had been to Germany. I had been to England. I had been to France. I hadn't been to the French countryside. I had been to the Cinque Terre. I had been to Rome. I'd been to Venice. So, but it's just completely different when it's your mom 19 years ago, which was a fabulous trip. And when it's with your husband and your 10 kids and a friend 
almost 20 years later. And so I was happy to see all those places again through different eyes, see them through my children's eyes. But even though I was familiar with them, it's not like I was an expert. I had been briefly once hopped around to all these different places. So it was so amazing that even with all the effort we put in, there's no way I don't think that we could have really known how perfectly that itinerary was going to work for our family. And I'll talk more about kind of in the highlights and in the logistics podcasts about what worked well and why certain things worked so well and about some things that didn't work and some funny experiences that we have with things that didn't go as well as we planned. But really, ultimately, it it could not have gone better and still have been real life. Let's put it that way. It just was so, so smooth in so many ways. And I'm so grateful. But the cool thing that I'm trying to express, I'll get back to it, is that the order of things, we went from pretty and charming and enjoyable to even prettier and more charming and more enjoyable for our family. Now, different people would have different experiences. So that by the time we got to Switzerland and that level of beauty was just proclaiming the majesty and the creativity and the incredible design of God everywhere that you looked, our kids were just mouths hanging open and so excited. And I think maybe if we had started in Switzerland and been blown away by the Alps and then ended somewhere that was a little less impressive, that there might have been some level of disappointment. Maybe not. But just kind of progressively working our way towards, holy, wow, Lord, look what you did. This is so cool, was such a great order. And then I will say that by the time we were in Switzerland for a while, it felt like, how will we ever get home? How will we ever not get home logistically? We knew how we were getting home on a plane, but how will we ever how will we ever make ourselves leave this? And then we did London, and London was not bad, but London is a city and you have to get on metros. And I will say that probably public transportation was the least favorite part of everywhere we went. Because it's just, you know, it's kind of stressful. You take up a lot of space. It's dirty. You have to keep babies from licking things. Getting off all at one time without the doors closing on you and squishing you. Trying not to get separated. That happened at least once. You know, just just there are a lot of stressful logistics involved. So while I left Switzerland with my heart so full and so grateful and so feeling like I could just stay here forever. By the time we got done with our week in London, I thought this was amazing, but I'm ready to go home. I'm ready for normalcy. I'm ready for routine. So I feel like even that, the Lord really orchestrated a way for us to kind of have an exit strategy that we didn't even, we didn't even plan. So hopefully you've enjoyed kind of that rambling through the whole process of getting us there. I won't I don't think take time to go and devote a podcast to each country, but I will in the next episodes talk about what that planning process looked like, like I promised, and I'll get some feedback from Sean for the logistics of how to find a car if you need a bunch of people in a car, or how to find the best places to stay, or where to look for tickets, or kind of how to plan for certain things because I feel like we learned some good lessons there and he did a really good job of that. But I said that I would talk about, this is what I'll close with. I said that I would talk about our high, low Buffalo and what that was. So some friends of ours have this thing that they do and I think they just do it on a daily basis or at least maybe anytime something significant has happened. So the high is obvious. That's the the best part of your day, what you enjoy the most or the best part of your trip and what you enjoy the most. The low is what you didn't enjoy so much. And the Buffalo is something that's completely unexpected and just kind of took you by surprise. So this is going to be hard. And I told you I would do this and I have to think because I don't even know that I can narrow it down to just one high. Probably the three favorite things as far as just pure adrenaline, enjoyment, kind of that giddy feeling of, are you kidding me, Lord, this is amazing. For me, and we've done this with our kids and their answers are different, but for me were, one, a hot air balloon ride that we took with our seven oldest kids, which the youngest of the seven would have been six, so not very old, but... The seven oldest kids, and again, that was a situation where Rachel stayed back at the rental and she played with Titus and Toby and Shiloh, and she knew from the very beginning that that was part of her job was to give us opportunities to take older kids out, so she was thrilled to do that. And of course, there were other situations where we all went together and she got to come with us 
and she was with us most of the time. So I'll answer more questions about her as y'all have them because I had quite a few questions about the logistics of bringing someone with you. But for now, I will just say that that balloon ride that we got to do with the older kids was amazing. It was this beautiful night. You know, the sun is shimmering on the horizon. We're floating over the Loire Valley, which is full of old castles and a patchwork quilt of green. And it's just lush and they grow a lot of... They grow a lot of produce and crops in that area. And I just remember kind of looking at Sean and just grinning my face off and thinking and watching my kids just stare out into the sunset because it was in the evening and just thinking this is one of those core memories of a moment of peace and joy and gratitude in this moment that this got to happen. And then another one would be, oh, and I will, I will make a note that I have been on one other hot air balloon ride in my life. And that was on my honeymoon with Sean. And while it was enjoyable, I don't remember that much from it. And I won't say that it was the most notable experience of my life or even up there in a top 10. It was fun, but that was about all I would say. And the guy that took us up, I can't remember hardly anything about. However, I will never forget the crew that took us up for this particular hot air balloon ride, they were Lithuanian. They, which is just fun because they had cool accents and they were just such charming, friendly, down to earth people. And they were so kind to the children. They didn't act like it was frustrating to have them on there at all. In fact, the guy that was the head of the whole operation had Theo and Honor both get up and, you know, release some flames to help us to go higher with a balloon. And they were just so accommodating and had such great attitudes. And I think they honestly, even beyond the beauty of the actual experience and the fun of floating through the air, made it so much better because their attitudes were amazing. And I will put that company down in the show notes because they really did a fantastic job. And I would love for them to get business if you ever go to Europe and want to go on a hot air balloon ride in that area. And then... A second really fun experience is kind of just a one of those bucket list experiences that I don't know that I'll ever get to do again was we got to paraglide over Interlaken in Switzerland. Now it was tandem paragliding because of, I've never done this in my life. So I'm not just going to strap a parachute on and go jump off a mountain. And there you don't jump off the mountain. You kind of walk. And in my case, you stumble and fall because... <laughs> Because the guy that you're with told you that you would just start walking and be lifted off the ground, but he didn't bother to mention that if side winds come in, you might get pulled off your feet to the side and stumble on the ground and then kind of get dragged. So that was my case, and my kids got to see that and were teasing me about it, which they should have been. I looked ridiculous. It was hilarious. My tandem paragliding instructor was Swiss slash French. He was Swiss, but he spoke French and German. And I remember we got into there and he goes, that was less than ideal. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. That was just not at all graceful on my part. And he didn't argue with me. So we're in the air. We're gliding. Apparently I like being in the air and gliding. Now what's funny is as a child, I would have said that I was afraid of heights in a lot of ways. But the fact of the matter is I'm not afraid of being up high. I just don't want to be dropped quickly from heights. So roller coasters and, you know, rides it at amusement parks where suddenly the bottom drops out and you have all these g-forces those are not necessarily my favorite but gliding through the sky high up in the air doesn't bother me one single bit in fact it's wonderful i love it it's the most weightless kind of ethereal otherworldly feeling and i will do that any day of the week so that paragliding experience just like i said with that unearthly beauty and of course it's not unearthly it's it's the earth that god has made but it just feels like you're in kind of a fairyland looking at all the blues and the greens and all the gorgeous colors was so much fun and then the third high for me would probably be that anniversary dinner that i mentioned with sean where we went to that town in austria wandered through the fields took pictures of the sunset it was gorgeous had one of the best meals of our lives honestly I will try to put the restaurant there in the show notes as well. I literally don't remember the name of the town. I don't remember the name of the restaurant. I just know the food was really good. And it was just one of the most relaxed, rejuvenating, just life-giving evenings with my husband that I've had in a really long time. And so I was really grateful for that for an anniversary dinner. So those were three highs for me. The lows would probably have been the public transportation. It's a grit your teeth and get through it type of thing. It works. It's so much cheaper than taking taxis or, you know, having a chauffeur. That's something we would never have even considered because it was just too much money. Now, we only did Paris, London, 
and Rome, I think, as far as places that had public transportation. And the kids literally, they, they, they had great attitudes. But afterwards, each time we did the Hilo Buffalo, they were like, we didn't love that one. So apparently my family likes being out in the countryside way more than we like being in cities. So good to know for future reference. So public transportation was always a little bit sketchy. It was always kind of felt like we were shoving our way in and taking up a lot of, a lot of space and um, trying to keep the babies from, you know, swinging from the rafters. And then we had, I'll, I'll tell you some stories, but I would say that in general, we had some really lovely experiences with Europeans. And it's, it's not fair to just say Europeans because each country had its own personality. Each country had its own vibe, if you will. And I just would have loved to have felt a little bit less like a nuisance in certain cases. And if you're thinking, um, Abby, there were 13 of you, you take up a lot of space. It really wasn't usually those instances where all of us were there and we were taking up a lot of space where someone kind of acted like we were getting in the way or they were frustrated to service or were curt. And I've heard a lot from a lot of Europeans saying like, this is, you know, you just need to get over this. This is just the way things are done here. But I'm not really talking about someone being direct. I actually myself am pretty direct and I would rather you just tell me straight than beat around the bush. I'm talking about actual annoyance or rudeness or, you know, probably just unkindness, honestly, and it would be unkind no matter what part of the world that you were in. I've told this story on social media as well, but the true low for me as far as my emotions was a moment where <laughs> we had gone to look at the Pieta and Sean had Titus and I had Toby and Titus had wiggled free while Sean was taking a picture and I could hear him pitter-pattering away into the main part of St. Peter's Basilica, which is where the Pieta is. And the Pieta is basically this incredibly detailed, just astoundingly well done uh, piece of art. It's a it's a sculpture of the Mary and Christ. And so Sean was taking the picture. I went to chase after Titus, and he wasn't doing anything terrible. He was just running out into the main part of St. Peter's Basilica. Sean comes after me. Toby starts losing his mind because he wants to nurse. And I have nursed all over Europe. And I usually have a cover with me, but if I don't, I just nurse discreetly, kind of pull up my shirt, have the baby kind of cross. And I say baby, this is a toddler. And you can't really even tell what I'm doing. It just looks like I'm holding him. So I was looking around for a place to nurse because Toby is melting down. And I went and I slid down with my back against the wall at the very back of St. Peter's Basilica, kind of in a corner and put a blanket over him. I'm covered from neck down to my ankles with this blanket. It's a huge blanket. You can't even really see Toby underneath it. And one of the attendants, security guard, something, came up to me and told me to basically nurse somewhere else and acted as if I were doing something very uncouth and problematic. And Honestly, if he'd come up and said, excuse me, madam, you know, because they say madam, which I find so charming, excuse me, madam, you know, we would prefer that you did not nurse here. I would, of course, you know, and I did say, of course, no matter what, but he rolled his eyes at me and he tissed his tongue and he clapped his hands together and kept throwing his hands at me like, what, what are you doing? Like, why are you here? What are you doing? <laughs> I felt so ashamed and embarrassed. So I struggled off the ground and went to try to find a place to nurse, but the place that he told me to go nurse was completely full of elderly people who needed a spot to sit. So then I tried to find some stairs to sit on, and I wasn't sure. I'm like, am I am I allowed to sit on these stairs and nurse? And sure enough, some guy started walking towards me, and maybe he was walking towards me to say, have a good day or good morning or something. But it felt like at that point with my heightened emotions and feeling like, oh no, I've just been kicked out of St. Peter's Basilica, that I wasn't supposed to be there. So, so I picked up Toby and Shiloh was having a meltdown as well and had him with me and he was just losing his mind. And so just in that particular moment, I really just wanted to go back to the rental and pull covers over my head and not go anywhere again. Now, of course, that's not what I did. And the day perked up after that and it was fine. And it, I can totally laugh about it now and it doesn't seem as stressful. But for about 30 minutes there, I was really done with Europe, which Feels like an overreaction, but just, you know, sometimes that's what your emotions are telling you. It's all bad. It wasn't all bad, but in that moment, that's how I felt. So that was probably emotionally my low of the trip. 
feeling so shamed and, and embarrassed and then thinking, but I wasn't doing anything shameful or embarrassing. And even if I wasn't supposed to be doing that, which I've heard from so many readers that they were like, I have totally nursed in St. Peter's Basilica. No one said a word to me. And I can't believe that guy did that. And that's not what he was supposed to do. So who knows? But he felt like it was what he was supposed to do. And in that moment, I felt very much so like I, who tend to be a rule follower, was breaking a major rule and was being a major inconvenience. So that was my low. Buffalo. Goodness. There were, there were, there were quite a few quirky things that happened. Probably one of the stranger buffaloes, I would say. Something else will come to me at some other point. And if it does, I'll tell you on a different podcast. But Sean and I were picking up food when we were in Bavaria. We were in Garmisch Partenkirchen, which is a really funny and fun city name. And so we were in Garmisch, which a lot of people shorten it to. And we had ordered food and we're picking it up. And Sean had been sitting in the car with the babies. And I came out, climbed in. He turned on the car and we were looking for a place to go get some water or something, some more snacks or something to go with our lunch. And as we were looking up Google directions, a man marched straight toward us. And I thought, surely not like what in the world we have the windows up. We're not doing any, like what could we possibly be doing wrong? And he motions for us, but surely so he really was coming to our car. So he motions for us to roll down the window. Sean rolls down the window and he leans in and says something in German. And he's, his head is like almost fully in the car. And we can't quite figure out what he's saying because we don't speak German, but we finally realize that he's saying that the car is running and it shouldn't be. So Sean presses the button to turn it off after we've kind of stared at him blankly and then stared at each other and okay, okay, I think he wants us to turn the car off. So we turn the car off and he stands there. He says something else that we don't understand. He fully sticks his head into our car. Not kidding. Like Sean had to move his head out of the way so the guy's head could fit inside the car. He listens, and I thought he was looking at Titus and Toby. He nods his head, he pulls his head out of the car, and he turns around and he marches away. And we look at each other and we're like, what just happened? That guy really make us turn our car off? And then I said, was he okay with the car running because of Titus and Toby? He goes, no, the car's off. I think he stuck his head in to make sure that it was really off. (laughs) So we were just very flummoxed. And Sean, you know, the car's off. He goes to pick up the food. And I think, oh, there must be some sort of, there must be some sort of regulation on this. So sure enough, I look up the laws for Germany. Can you have your car running? And there is a no idling law. And those of you that already know this are nodding and saying, duh, Abby, you didn't know this. And I'm like, nope, didn't know this. And y'all, I'm telling you, we had been idling for maybe three minutes as we were looking at Google Maps, trying to find a place to go. So it's not like we sat there for 30 minutes or 10 minutes even. But this guy was going to make sure that that law was enforced. It was, you know, feeling a little bit citizens arresty there for a moment. (laughs) I was so confused. So that was definitely a buffalo because, you know, when you're in a place where you don't know the rules and you don't know the customs and you don't know all of the laws because it hadn't occurred to me to look up, is it legal to idle in Germany or whatever, um, even for a couple of minutes, then, you know, it takes you a minute to catch up with what's going on, especially when there's foreign languages, well, foreign to you. They're, they're native language, of course, but when you don't speak the, the language of that country, so that was definitely a buffalo of like, I don't think I know what's going on. I cannot believe this guy cares about this too. Oh, light bulb moment. That's why. So there's a not so brief intro to our time in Europe, and I will be sharing more with you in the future. I hope you enjoyed that roundup of memories and thoughts on the subject and that I get to see you again next time. If you guys enjoyed today's program, I would be so honored if you would subscribe and share with others. And if you're looking for more daily content on motherhood and biblical responses to cultural issues, you can follow along on Instagram at m.is.for.mama. 